Um, good morning. Um, we're excited to have you with us today at Tackling Brain Injuries Through Education Design, or TBI Ed. Um, this conference is sponsored by the Department of Family Medicine at the Alfred Medical School and also the Department of Cognitive Linguistic and Psychological Sciences here at Brown, as well as our faculty advisor, Dr. David Eagleman. Uh, my name is Caitlin Frankland and I'm a member of the class of 2020 studying neuroscience. Um, my name is Emma McMillan and I'm a member of the class of 2020.5 studying public health. Um, over the past six months, Caitlin and I have been working on a document titled Concussion Prevention, Management and Education Implications for Brown University and the NCAA. Um, this document is a result of our individual research into the NCAA's concussion policy and education programming available to student athletes as well as our investigation and evaluation of Brown-specific policy and education practices. We began this project as part of a class assignment and continued our research under Dr. Eagleman's guidance throughout the summer. We were fortunate to attend the American Academy of Neurology Sports Concussion Conference this summer in July in Indianapolis. Okay, so why are you guys here? Um, <laughs> we want to learn from you. Um, we want to bring together a group of experts from a variety of fields, from different perspectives of sports, concussion and the effects of traumatic brain injury at the individual, community, and population levels. We also want to acknowledge the stakeholders who couldn't make it today and the voices in the conversation we may be missing. The purpose of this workshop is to engage stakeholders in concussion policy and education through interactive presentations and conversations. We hope to use what we learned today to revise and craft a concussion-specific education program for student athletes that could be rolled out in fall of 2019. We want to determine the most effective ways to measure the impact of this program and how to continuously revise it. Before we begin, we would like to disclose that our faculty advisor, Dr. Eagleman, has served as an expert witness in concussion litigation at the request of students who suffered head injuries in football. He is helping to fund this conference, though played no direct role in the preparation of this program. Um, and also we recognize that we have a very busy schedule today and while we encourage as much participation as possible, we um, understand if you need to step out at any point to take calls or anything else. All right, that being said, our first speaker today is Dr. Stephen Small from UC Irvine. <coughs> oh, Dr. Small is Professor of Neurology, Neurobiology and Behavior and Cognitive Sciences at the U University of California, Irvine and the Director and Chief Scientific Officer of the Medical Innovation Institute. <coughs> a new in, uh, initiative of the UCI Health School of Medicine. Dr. Small has helped us a lot with the planning and initiatives of this workshop, and it is an honor to have him here today to open the event. Okay, I just turned it on, so we're good. Um, Is that one on? Oh. Can you press uh, the push the bottom and hold it for about three seconds. So uh, we're good. Um, so um, hello. <laughs> okay, let me uh, for the for the, for the video. Let me thank uh, Caitlin, Emma, and David once more, um, and thanks everybody for coming once more. And um, let me just tell you how uh, the first hour is going to go here. Um, we cooked this up uh, over the last few months. Um, we've invited some of uh, Brown's athletes, uh, uh, Division One athletes, to come and um, participate this morning for, for a little while. And um, the way I would like to, 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 to do this is I'm going to just talk to these guys for maybe five minutes now. Then I'm going to give a little talk. And then I'm going to talk to them again and see what they think about their answers to my questions after uh, a half hour of discussion. Um, and um, when we get to the end, when we start having that discussion, we'll have a couple minutes of discussion. Everybody can put in their two cents worth. So um, <coughs> why don't you introduce yourselves and what's, just say what your name is and what sport you're in. And uh, um, go ahead. Uh, I'm Melissa, and I was a swimmer at Brown. Melissa was a swimmer at Brown for the, the audio. <laughs> um, I'm Charlotte Devon, and I play soccer. <coughs> Hi guys, my name is Santi Nunez and I'm a senior on the water polo team. 
Hi, I'm Jack Wilson, and I'm a junior on the water polo team. Okay, so thanks. That's great. Um, so um, you guys know this is about concussion today, right? Um, can um, Jack, you want to tell me what you think a concussion is? Um, so I had never really known anything about concussions until last season when I got hit in the head for the first time, um, when it actually, you know, had an impact on my life. Because I mean, I'd been hit in the head many times in high school, and nothing really happened. Happened, so I didn't really so think much of it. So tell me what you think a concussion is. What, what, what's uh, um, through high school and college? What did, what have you thought of as a concussion? You say you had one, but yeah. what, what was your definition all, all this time? Um, basically, when your brain bounces against the side of your skull and gets injured to put it How do you know when you have that? Um, just the classic symptoms like headache, difficulty concentrating, um, things okay. like that. Okay. Let's go, let's move it, move it. Um, what's a concussion, Santi? Yeah, a concussion for me was just, um, again, right. similar how he, he said, you know, when your brain hits the side of your skull from the blow and, um, how did I know I had one? Um, you know, I, I remember getting hit in the head and kind of feeling a little wonky. Um, and then, you know, I was had a headache and I went to, you know, eat dinner and I was like, all right, maybe it's because I was hungry. Um, and then I went to the library and I started writing a paper and that paper just did not write itself. <laughs> so, so that's how I knew I was definitely concussed. Charlie? <laughs> yeah, I'd say a concussion is when you get a blow to the head and your brain is bouncing around inside your skull. And for me, uh, when I got hit, I just got up and I knew it just didn't feel right, so I was a little shaken up. Got it. Uh, for me, a concussion was the same thing, your brain bouncing around in your skull, but it wasn't until I actually got a concussion that um, I, like, I, I was told that it's a traumatic brain injury, um, and it's a lot more severe than I first thought. And um, for me, I knew that I had a concussion because when I got up uh, off the floor, I, like, I couldn't walk straight. So let me, let me ask you guys a question. So when you're in high school, let's talk about before you ever had a concussion. You're in high school, okay? Um, you're a water polo team. You were in high school in LA, right? Um, anybody in your team have a concussion in high school? Um, no, I don't think anyone on my team had a concussion. How about you, Miami? Anybody in your team have a concussion in high school? None that were diagnosed. Charlotte, soccer? Yes, there are a couple, including myself in high school. Okay. Um, just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so uh, it's uh, it, it's interesting. Um, it turns out when men and women play uh, the same sports with the same rules, women are more likely to have concussion than men. And we don't know why that is. There's a lot of theories about that, but we, we really don't know why that is. So let me, let me give a little talk about concussion, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, I need to hold this baby, I guess. Yeah. The other mic will work. Yeah, this mic should work. Yep, good. Okay, so um, actually I was gonna interview them after a few slides, but I'll just carry on here. So, um, what is traumatic brain injury? TBI is an alteration of brain function or other evidence of brain pathology caused by an external force. TBI traditionally has been divided into mild TBI, moderate, or severe. And severe TBI, severe traumatic brain injury, that's people, they're in car accidents, they end up in the intensive care unit. That's a very severe disease, and that's a little bit different than what we're talking about today. Um, concussion statistics in sports, concussion stats are gross underestimations. Uh, the epidemiology of mild TBI is unknown. The CDC and World Health Organization suggest the actual numbers of total TBI may, as much, may be as much as 10 times higher than reported. The current estimate is that almost four million sports-related concussions occur in the United States. If you look at the stats, usually it's how many people go to the emergency department. Many people don't go to the emergency department. They just, uh, they, they have these, these problems. 
Um, and here, uh, what I just mentioned informally, in sports with comparable rules played by both gender, soccer, lacrosse, water polo, females have twice the rate of concussions as males. Um, so if you talk to the American Academy of Neurology, the American Academy of Sports, oh, sorry guys, <laughs> American Academy of <laughs> Should have thought of that, oh well, uh, sorry about that. But Brown undergraduates are not ones who shirk from just taking the, taking it out of themselves. Um, the American Academy of Neurology, the American Academy of Rehab Medicine, of Neurosurgery, they all sort of agree with this kind of definition. Traumatically induced physiologic disruption of brain function resulting from the head being struck or striking an object or the brain undergoing an acceleration and deceleration movement as manifested by at least one of the following. Loss of consciousness less than 30 minutes, amnesia less than a day, confusion or disorientation, and transient neurologic abnormalities. Um, in plain English, um, in plain English, I'll get to plain English in a second, but basically uh, what, uh, what, what that all means is a, a bop on the head with symptoms. That's all it is, okay? Any bop on the head with symptoms. Well, let's go into a, a little um, true-false test here, okay? Um, and I want everybody to participate. Um, a concussion is an injury caused by physical trauma. Yes or no? True. Although we can talk about Cuba later, David. Um, it's an interesting, I was just in Havana last weekend talking to the guys who were working on that. Um, anyone wants to talk about the Cuban embassy, I, I have a lot of information. It's very similar to concussion, maybe. A concussion is different from other head injuries in that concussions always have loss of consciousness. False. False. You guys knew that. You guys are ahead of the curve here. A concussion is a brain injury. True. Very good. I'm not teaching you anything today. Concussions occur primarily in football and rarely in other sports. False. Concussions occur primarily in professional sports and rarely in amateur sports. False. Athletes who have their bell rung or get dinged have actually had concussions. Did anybody in your high school say they got their bell rung? Yeah. Yep. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. They got their bell rung, right? Yep. But they didn't have concussions. You told me before that nobody had concussions. Uh, no, that I know. Yeah. What's, what's a concussion again? So yeah, yeah, true. And women? Any of your, any uh, in, in your sport? Um, anybody have their bell rung? Yeah. Where, did they have concussions? Not all were diagnosed. So um, this is where I might be more controversial than average. I think when you get your bell rung, you had a concussion. And when I went to the water polo team, I do research in the water polo team at UC Irvine, ask all the men, any of you ever had a concussion? No. Any of you ever have your bell rung? All the time, okay? And I, I believe that um, this is another, I got another one here. How about seeing stars? Any of you guys see stars? What what made your what made your eyes see stars? <laughs> so I think that's also a concussion. Okay. <laughs> um, if an athlete has a concussion in a game but has no loss of consciousness, he can return to the game once he feel he or she feels okay. Asymptomatic head impacts in intercollegiate sports, other than football, do not cause brain injury. I don't think we know that. <laughs> okay? I don't think we really know. So, suppose you have an asymptomatic head impact, and then you don't have any more asymptomatic head impact for the rest of the year. That happens to all of us all the time, probably. Right? But suppose you have an asymptomatic head impact, and then an hour later you have another asymptomatic head impact. Or how about 20 minutes later? Or how about five minutes later? Or how about you actually have three in the course of a week? You guys do tourney. You know, water polo guys, they do tournaments. You know, you do a weekend tournament. You pay, what, three matches in a weekend, something like that? Three to four, yeah. Three to four, right. So suppose over the course of three to four you have one asymptomatic head impact on every single one of those games, right? Is that? 
Is that a problem? We don't know. I think we don't know. I hope we don't know, because I just put in an NIH grant proposal on that topic. Okay. <laughs> and if we do know, I'm in trouble. Okay, so uh, common jargon for concussions. Um, getting your bell rung uh, refers to when a player undergoes a huge blow to his head, and he can hear ringing noise in his head. Coach, why are you holding your ears? You, blah, blah, blah. I got my bell rung, okay? Getting dinged, seeing stars. I believe all of this is common jargon, which really uh, means concussion. So um, is it a matter of semantics? Here's a, I, I forget where I got this, some website, okay? Um, Denver Broncos cornerback Tony Carter doesn't have a concussion. Many feared that Carter had suffered a concussion, but head coach John Fox told reporters today that Carter is going to be fine. Despite seeing some stars, Carter did not suffer a concussion and should be good to go for the Super Bowl, okay? Um, What's, what are the incentives in athletics? What are the incentives in the NFL? Hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, to say, you know, I'm fine, you know, if I don't say I'm fine. But how about you guys? You know, I'll, I'll focus on the men's water polo team first, but <laughs> the women's soccer team is probably the same, right? Um, you know, what are your, what are your colleagues going to do? Are they going to say, you know, um, that's okay, Jack, we don't need a two-meter defender. We don't need our starting two-meter defender today. Is that what they're going to say? I mean, the, the, no, never say that. Yeah. the incentives, the incentives are really strongly against uh, uh, actually having a concussion. So, um, yeah, I, I promised you I'd, I'd give you TBI concussion in plain English. Any bump on the head with symptoms is the current definition. Um, more carefully speaking, a concussion is a head impact followed by symptoms that is not severe enough to be classified as moderate severe TBI. So. Um, a bump on the head without symptoms. So a bump on the head with symptoms, that definition is a clinical definition. There's no, physio there's no physiology to this. That is something that people like me, a neurologist, <coughs> a neurologist, a neurologist in the office would say you have a concussion. Then I want to know how long do you stay out? How long, when are you going to be all better? And all this stuff. And we don't know the answers to that. It's all seat of the pants. And Emma and Caitlin and I were at the American Academy of Neurology meeting, and that's what they were saying at that meeting. They were saying, well, you know, my expert opinion is that you should stay out until you feel all better, or stay out for three weeks, or stay out for two weeks. Is there, did you hear any physiology as to why that was the case? Is there any science underlying that? So that's what we need. That's where we're going with this, okay? A concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. And in, in, the, in the area of sports, concussion and TBI are interchangeable terms. Um, you guys, um, I, uh, this is just for, for entertainment value here, okay. <laughs> okay, that's the National Football League. Um, the National, I know uh, um, uh, Dr. Engelman is, is very much involved in advocacy and um, when you try to do advocacy with the National Football League, you, no pun intended, you bang your head against the wall, okay? Because the NFL doesn't want to hear about this. The NFL just, it can't afford to hear about this. But this is the kind of thing, every single Sunday, this is the kind of thing that happens. It's a little freaky. I used to be a big football fan. I still am to some degree. Um, but I don't watch as much as I did before, and I feel very much like we got to fix this sport. Um, any of you ever watched an Australian football game? It's quite, yeah, um, it's quite a different, it's quite interesting. No helmets, and uh, so there's no, no helmets as, as, as weapons. And um, it's much more finesse sport. I think there's much less trauma in that. Do you agree with that? No. <laughs> you think there is tra more trauma, as much yeah, trauma? Yeah, Australian football. Australian uh, yeah, the, football? Yeah, well, they have massive concussion of problems um, because they, well, they, in fairness, the, the athletes now are getting a lot smaller, a lot more like fitter, turn into more. So they're yeah, they're morphing <laughs> into the American kind of yeah, style. But they do they leave the shoulder and they get a lot well, of. That's that's too bad. When I watched it, I thought it was more finesse, and they definitely don't have the the helmets as weapons, which is what's really no, hurting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The great football team. We took the Pittsburgh Steelers. We knew that habit, not only a dream. <laughs> Go out there. Okay. Any of you Steelers fans here? No Steelers fans. Okay. So here's. Please, I don't know if you saw this one. Here's college football. So, um. 
college football, particularly Division One A, but also um, in uh, Division One, Two, and so forth. Um, so we all know about the, the issues in football. Football has been in all the newspapers. Um, I don't know if you guys know um, what's happening uh, in some of the Ivy League schools. I'm an alumnus of Dartmouth. I'm very proud that Dartmouth has eliminated full contact uh, practices um, in, in football. And, I, I, and believe it or not, they went from, I don't know, 0 and 9 or something the year they had full contact practices and they won the Ivy League championship the year that they got rid of those practices. So it's not really related to, um, to success on the field. Okay. Um, so um, with football, so football is the biggest story uh, in the news and so forth. And um, I don't know if you've, you've, you know this history, maybe you do, uh, but in 1905, college football um, had 18 deaths and 159 severe injuries. And, um, and you know what the powerhouse teams were in 1905? The powerhouse football teams? It wasn't, it wasn't Alabama and Oklahoma. Huh? It was the Ivy League, that's right. And Carlisle. And Carlisle. Carlisle? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so you know where the first Heisman Trophy winner came from? I'll give you a clue. It's, uh, it's a school that now is Division III and, ba and got rid of football for about 25 years, has football again. The first Heisman Trophy winner uh, was from the University of Chicago. And the University of Chicago, some years later, they quit the Big Ten. They were a founding member of the Big Ten. And they quit the Big Ten, and Michigan State took their place. Uh, but in this era, the Ivy League was the king of football. That's absolutely right. And um, Teddy Roosevelt called in. Uh, I think it was the coaches of Yale, and one of, I know Yale, the Yale coach was there, one other coach, um, and told colleges that if football could not put an end to on-field brutality, he would abolish the game with executive order and the coaches got to work. Uh, and so this was the, actually the beginning of the NCAA. And this is what the helmets look like in that era. Um, so uh, we have a soccer player here um, from Brown soccer, women's soccer team. Um, I don't know if you saw this one, but soccer, yep. So soccer also is a, a, um, a sport of some risk. Um, this was just this year, I think, in the Olympics, wasn't it? So there's two heads coming together. Um, and if you look at the rates of, the NCAA compiles statistics on concussion in sports. Do you know what the NCAA statistics are on men's water polo? They don't collect data on men's water polo. It's safe. <laughs> it's almost, I'll show you in a second. They don't collect any data on men's water polo or women's water polo. Um, so um, here's wrestling, football, ice hockey. Uh, you guys know the drill, women's field hockey as well. Um, and um, it, it seems like wrestling, football, soccer, lacrosse, and hockey are among the uh, most uh, risky sports. Um, and um, basically, uh, we really have to understand this better because anything you do can lead to uh, head impacts and, and issues. So. Um, this, um, this is a, a personal story. So you guys know I'm a neurologist. I, I, um, my research has always been in brain imaging, functional brain imaging, MRI, functional MRI, uh, usually of normal, normal cortical function in language and cognition. And um, I was giving a talk at a conference in, um, outside the United States, some diff way different time zone. I think it was Europe, so it was like eight hours different for me in California. And I got a call in the middle of the night from my friend Doug Knoll, who is a professor of um, electrical engineering at the University of Michigan, who taught me how to do <coughs> functional MRI. When he, 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 was, he had um, developed pulse sequences for fMRI as PhD thesis. And he taught me how to do that. And he called me and he said his son um, was seeing stars. And it was lasting for, it had lasted already for 24, 48 hours. And he, this was the video of Doug's son, who's now, he's starting now at um, Oxy, on the, uh, on the water polo team at Oxy. And, um, but he was in high school then, and uh, I, I, um, 
Oh, this is what Doug, this is what Doug wrote in his email. My son tries to put up his hand to block the shot on the goal, but can't get his hand over to protect his head. He appears mostly okay immediately afterwards. He plays until the next stoppage of the game, about two minutes when the coach pulls him out and doesn't let him go back in. He starts getting a headache, and after the game, his mom calls me, um, and, um, and he was at a conference in the US, and then he called me, um, and uh, he missed two days of school with a headache, saw a neurologist on the second day, and started the concussion protocol which basically means you get tested and you, you, um, um, you wait till you're symptom free. Um, and, uh, and you stay away from doing heavy duty um, intellectual activities um, and you stay away from doing heavy duty physical activities and you definitely stay away from your sport. Um, he struggles with schoolwork for most of the next week. He shouldn't have been doing schoolwork. Gets clearance to resume full contact practices and play in games on the 13th day and it seems okay in school at about the same time. And this is a typical story. This is a similar <laughs> story. Um, some of you guys probably had a similar kind of story, um, and that's the way it works. So here we have the NCAA impact expectation for different sports. If you guys are parents, this is a very important table. Um, and you see where water polo is. Uh, the contact and collision are the, are the most risky. Um, the contact are less and the limited contact is less. And swimming is theoretically risk-free, okay? Except if you slip when you're running to the pool or you bang your head into the wall because you're losing track of where the end of the pool is or whatever, and um, you've heard of a number of concussions even in swimming, right? Besides your own, yeah. Um, so look at where water polo is, and this is a real mistake. They don't even collect statistics on this. Um, it needs to be up there, obviously. And, um, and we've been studying this uh, for a few years now, um, and uh, we're, we're collecting, I'll tell you a little about what we're, the data we're collecting. I didn't plan to do it uh, this morning, but I can over the course of the day. So um, the International Olympic Committee has just given, uh, put the uh, USA water polo on notice. And um, it turns out, I don't know if you know this, that water polo was the first team sport um, admitted into the, inter, into the Olympics. Um, and what's happened is over the last hundred years since water polo was admitted into the Olympics, the rules have not changed. So we use the, we play under the same rules now as we did a hundred years ago. And there is, um, uh, we can talk about the kinds of hits that you get in water polo, um, but there are lots and lots of hits. We did a paper, an epidemiology paper, a few years ago, which I think uh, Emma and Caitlin read as part of their course with Dr. Engelman. And um, um, we found that during uh, practice, goalies uh, had about, a th about 30 percent of goalies had concussion in practice. Um, because when they're in practice, the goalies are standing in front of the goal with no defender in front. And so you just throw the ball at the goalie, and the goalie is practicing deflecting the ball without any defenders. So 30% of all goalies got concussions in practice. And I think after our paper was published, um, the goalies now on your teams wear helmets during the practice period. During games, what you don't see under the water and what you, what you do see above the water is a lot of elbows, a lot of feet, um, and I don't know, I, my guess is about half of it is intentional and about half of it is unintentional. Am I close? Something like you that? You hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to get somebody out of the way, okay, or you're just kicking off to go to the goal. I mean, you know, if, if there's a head in the way of where you're kicking, well, you know, <laughs> so be it. Um, so it turns out in the Rio de Janeiro Olympics, the two riskiest sports in the entire Olympics were boxing and water polo in terms of risk to head injury. And um, according to, we, we got some inside word, this is not public information, but uh, because USA Water Polo is based in Orange County, um, and we have uh, my, my collaborator, Jim Hicks, is really the water polo expert of our team, I'm, a, I'm the neuroscientist. Um, so he got some inside info that, we, that we've been told we need to change the rules or they're not going to be admitted into the Olympics in the future, that they have to have some rule changes to make this a safer sport. Um, the signs and symptoms, uh, you all know these. Um, headache, nausea, vomiting, balance problems, fatigue, sensitivity to light, numbness, tingling, uh, um, feeling stunned, 
and cognition is affected. I'm feeling foggy, slowed down, concentration problem, uh, memory problems, um, and so forth, and emotional um, and sleep problems. And sleep problems are extremely common. Did you guys have sleep problems? Disrupted sleep compared to before? Yeah. Um, and um, um, the emotional problems, I, I won't. Uh, We'll keep that private, but <laughs> those things happen as well. Um, post-concussive syndrome. Um, so post-concussive syndrome is, uh, these again are clinical terms. So it's very frustrating for a scientist to have to build, um, um, sort of build stories based on just purely clinical terms. Because this is based on experience. This is not based on measuring brain function or, or um, any, any kind of objective measures. So um, what, what, what experienced uh, concussion doctors would say is that most concussion symptoms resolve in one to three weeks. Sometimes they can be persistent. Um, and there's an overlap uh, between the symptoms of post-concussive syndrome and post-traumatic <coughs> stress disorder. And um, there are a bunch of um, sequelae of this, um, including uh, depression, anxiety, and other kinds of things besides uh, the symptoms of um, of uh, dizziness and the symptoms of headache and the symptoms of concentration problems. Careful management of activities, return to work, school, return to learning, and symptoms um, uh, um, and, and evaluation by a sports medicine specialist are key. So I recommend um, anyone who has um, symptoms that don't resolve in one to three weeks go to a sports medicine or sports neurologist specialist to get management because even though we don't know the physiology, those people see hundreds or thousands of patients, and so they have a sense of what should be expected and what, what could be expected. Um, we have to mention CTE. In the white paper that uh, Emma and Caitlin wrote, they did mention CTE. I told them I, I thought it was maybe not the most relevant to the sports concussion story, um, but um, it is something that's in, in all the news. Um, everyone here, I'm sure, anyone not heard of CTE? Yeah, I mean, it's in, it's in the news, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and um, there's one, um, our, uh, our um, econometrician uh, from uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, <laughs> so uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, is a, a, brain, uh, a, a brain disorder. It's been in the news lately uh, because of a number of NFL, retired NFL players have had all sorts of psychiatric symptomatology, including uh, suicidality. There have been suicides. Um, there, has, there have been changes in behavior. I'll tell you just, uh, um, yeah, um, and uh, I'll finish that story, and then I'll tell you an anecdote. Um, and um, the um, brains of some of these individuals have been evaluated pathologically after they died, and they show certain kinds of pathologic hallmarks of neurodegeneration, serious neurodegeneration, in a different pattern, similar kinds of micropathology, but in a different pattern than you see in Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia or the other neurodegenerative disease. It's in a different pattern. It's up in the higher part of the cortex um, as opposed to in the temporal lobes. And um, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty indicative and, and pretty pathognomonic of uh, uh, this encephalopathy. Interestingly, um, Many of the players who have this are players who are on, on the line. The linemen had this, and many of them did not complain very often of concussion. What they had is they had constant head impact every single weekend for years and years and years. And we don't know to what extent two or three of those precipitated it, to what extent it required years and years of that. Um, it's been in the news a lot because there now have been about 100 brains of people who died sent to Boston University, which has a laboratory that studies this. And of the 100 brains or so, there's a, a big, there's some uh, uh, articles on this, um, almost all, 95%, had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, had brain serious neurodegeneration. So the, people are, are um, misstating the, the story here a little bit in that the only brains that were sent to Boston University is people who were who had psychiatric disease and or neurologic disease during lifetime. And so the brains that were sent to be pathologically examined were people who clinically seemed to have a neurodegenerative disease. 
And so when the brains were sent there, the, the, some of the newspapers that were not as careful as other newspapers reported 95% of football players have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's not at all the case. Uh, but 95% of people who look like pre-morbidly that they had a serious neurologic or psychiatric disease, in fact, did have that. Does that relate to everyday sports at Brown University? Um, I don't think it does very much, um, except possibly for linemen on the football team. And I think linemen on football teams, we need to evaluate very separately. And I'm not gonna talk about football today. It's a, it's a separate kind of an issue. Um, and it needs to, there needs to be a whole separate effort um, in, in football. Um, and, and it's a political issue that the NFL is, is involved in, the NCAA is involved in, the Department of Defense is involved in. Um, but in other sports, the question is, if you have multiple head impacts, um, is that going to lead to something like this? And I think most evidence says it is not. But the question is, when you have multiple head impacts, what kind of damage does it do to your brain? We really don't know. That was my, the last of my <coughs> true false studies. So um, the, the biology in animals does suggest that a traumatic brain injury in animal model systems, if you have a traumatic brain injury very closely proximal temporally to a previous traumatic brain injury, you're at much higher risk of having um, um, damage to your brain than if, you, if they're spaced out very, very far. And so we, we recommend, and this is relevant to uh, athletics here, um, that um, someone with a mild traumatic brain injury not go back in uh, for, for quite some time. And how much time is still, we need, we need the physiology on that. Um, we need to do prevention, we need better refereeing, we need better protective headgear, um, uh, we need better, better rules in some of these sports, that's what's gonna happen with water polo early assessment of injury, carefully staged return to play, and not before that when it's right. So um, just in summary, and we'll, get, we'll now have discussion, uh, concussion is mild traumatic brain injury. Loss of consciousness is not needed for diagnosis. You guys knew that, but which is good. Concussions in sports and recreation are highly prevalent. Um, we know that certain sports have risk. We don't realize that other sports also have risk. Um, and prevention uh, of concussion and, um, and prevention of long-term effects are, are key. So um, with that, um, why don't we move to a, a discussion again. Um, does anyone have questions before we move to the discussion? David. Yeah. The, the reason that I said no to the trauma issue is that for me, it's an acceleration, deceleration mm -hmm. issue. You don't need to, for example, if you're in a car accident, the car stops suddenly, you stop suddenly, your brain still moves. Yeah, I, I Okay, I, I, and so you're not, you're not actually hit. No, that's true, that's okay. true. Um, but you're, that's right. Um, right. No, that, that's fair enough. But it's a physical trauma to the brain, yeah. Right, but, but people associated with, if you don't get hit in the head, you don't have a concussion, that's not true. Right, no, that, that's a good point. No, that's a good point. I, I think that's a good point. And, um, you know, the, I, I mentioned the Cuban embassy, uh, the American embassy in Cuba, because there are, um, there, there are a lot of people who are, are arguing now that what the, the, what, the um, what those um, employees had was similar to a concussion from some, again, non-physical kind of thing. So um, do you guys know what the SCAT is, the um, sports uh, evaluation? So, um, at, at UC Irvine, um, I mentioned this to our players here, um, at UC Irvine, I instituted three years ago because I was interested in this, um, SCAT testing, that is preseason evaluation of symptoms and, and some, some minor cognitive uh, traits, uh, preseason in everybody. So we, I, I, it was all volunteers, it was people like you guys, it was like I'd take these and then Caitlin, I'd bring them to the clinic and they would do the testing, okay? We had undergrads, we had grad students, we had medical students, we had residents. Um, I had my wife, dragged my wife in. <laughs> we all, so we had about 10 to 12 uh, amateurs um, who had uh, uh, iPads. We have an iPad scat uh, thing, and um, which we, neurology paid for. And um, we did preseason testing on over 300 athletes. And then we gave the iPads to all the trainers. And so the trainers had those same iPads during the season. And so if anybody got hit again, you'd be able to compare it. Um, the, 
Do you guys know what the symptom inventory on the scan is? How many, how many know about the, these, um, these tests? Yeah? Okay. So um, the, I'll, I'll read to you the symptom inventory just for kicks. Um, and and uh, you think about whether you've had these in the last, um, in the last week, okay? Headache, pressure in the head, neck pain, nausea or vomiting, dizziness, blurred vision, balance problems, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise, feeling slowed down, feeling like in a fog, don't feel right, difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering, fatigue or low energy, confusion, drowsiness, more emotional, irritability, sadness, nervous or anxious, trouble falling asleep. Um, anybody had any one of those in the last week? Anybody have none of those in the last week? We gave that to all, I told you, 300 players um, each of three seasons, and we tabulated this. This is preseason. This is, you know, the, the people are practicing all year round if you're Division I. Okay? So, <laughs> but we gave this. Um, and what do you think the breakdown was in men and women on that? This isn't published yet, but it's in the Neuroscience, Society for Neuroscience proceedings. What's that? Higher reporting. Yeah. Higher reporting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, women by far reported more symptoms. Um, and when we asked the women's water polo team, any of you had a concussion <coughs> ever? Probably half or three quarters of them said yes. Zero of the men's water polo team said yes. Okay. And, uh, and so um, th this notion that women have more concussions um, we need the physiology to find out whether this is a reporting issue or whether this is uh, something related to physiology, and we don't know what that is. So um, what do you guys think? Do you guys agree with what I said? Oh, I need that. Thanks. What do you think? Yeah, I would, I would say I definitely agree with what you said. So in high school, uh, you, are you going to revise up the zero? I would, for sure, yeah. I don't know how many, I would say. But, uh, probably a couple. Um, so probably a lot of people on your team definitely. Have, have some symptomatology yeah, definitely. like that. Yeah. So, we don't, um, so what we, we don't know what is happening to the brain in those situations. We, we just don't know. Um, we know something's happening to the brain, or there wouldn't be symptoms, right? Um, and the symptoms are very, very transient. Um, but transient symptoms doesn't always mean transient brain injury. So take any neurologic disease and you can lose this, you can get rid of the symptoms within a day or two days, um, but the, the disease can, can, can remain and may take, may take weeks or months to, to, to go away or, or may not go away. Uh, multiple sclerosis is an example. Thankfully, the symptoms frequently will go away in multiple sclerosis but there's some brain injury that, that remains. And we don't know anything about that in concussion. Um, but I, I would, if I was your, your parents, you know, if I was your dad, I would say, if you got your bell rung, I, I would uh, stay out of game, stay out, of, stay out for a week or two. Um, but that's all seat of the pants neurology. That's not based on the fact that I can do an MRI scan of your brain, a functional MRI, a diffusion tensor image, I can do an EEG, I can do heart rate variability, I can do a blood-based biomarker, I can look at uh, um, uh, S100 beta, I can look at uh, UCH uh, L1, or look at all these proteins, and say, yes, there's some injury. I can't do that right now. That's what we want to do. We want to know when, uh, when is the brain injured and when is the brain not injured anymore. Um, any comments about the, my... my uh, Sales pitch here? No, I mean, I agree with everything you said. I, again, I think for, that's why when I answered when you were asking me at the high school, um, if anyone had uh, concussions, I said, you know, none that were diagnosed because, you know, everyone was very, you know, I feel like until very recently, concussions were very taboo or treated as taboo in terms of like, you know, people kind of being like, tough it out. Um, tough like, it out, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. That's kind of like the culture um, around sports in general. Um, and I feel like that's something that needs to change, you know, in order for these, I guess, studies to go yeah, on. Yeah, and, and Brown University has a tremendous opportunity here. I can give you, so I started this concussion, st trying to study um, this stuff uh, three years ago. And I was extraordinarily lucky because the athletic director at UC Irvine was a protege of Bill Walsh from Stanford. He had a real interest in academia. He viewed, him, he viewed his athletes as students as well as athletes. 
um, and um, and that's really that was really important. I have friends at the big in the Big Ten um, who are interested in neuroscientists who are interested in traumatic, mild traumatic brain injury as I am, and the athletic directors kept them away from any of the athletes, would not let them even in the room. Um, with with my athletic director, um, who unfortunately has just left right before I submitted my NIH proposal, which was worrisome, uh, Mike Izzy just just left uh, to go to a different place. Um, but he, I, I, I remember a meeting with him two years ago, and he used to call me Doc. So um, you say Doc, say yes, Mike. He say. I get the impression you want to put a sign on top of the athletic department that says Smalls Laboratory. And I'm, I'm getting nervous, like these two were early this morning. <laughs> I'm getting nervous, but <laughs> he's going to throw me out of the street. And he said, great. He said, great, that's what we want. And he was planning to use it as a recruiting tool. I mean, he was going to go out and tell parents, you come to UC Irvine. You know, we've been number one in water polo um, in, in the country. Uh, but we also have the neurology department completely embedded in our program, um, and um, you know, and the soccer, the soccer coach, the women's soccer coach as well, men's and women's water polo coaches as well, um, are, are 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 completely completely on board. So, Brown has a tremendous opportunity. I think the Ivy League in general should be taking the lead on this. I, I think that's what, what should be going on. Charlotte. Yeah, I definitely believe there are a lot of underreported um, concussions through high school. I think the biggest difference for me was playing club versus high school because at least through high school and here at Brown, you have the trainers and the resources checking up on you, but in club, you're really on your own. Your coach has no idea about that kind of stuff, so they want to win, so they're going to throw you back in there, and it's kind of up to you to say something. So teach me something. So in my, in my grant proposal that I just put in, we, we plan to compare club and, and Division One athletes. And then in, in, in sports that, uh, in fact, soccer and water polo are the two sports that we that we included because men and women play by the same rules. Um, is the intensity in club similar to in the Division One? Uh, no, I'd say it's less intense, but I don't think that means there's any less concussions. Oh, okay, interesting. Any comments on swimming or on any of this? Um. Uh, definitely, I agree with everything you were saying, um, and I think long-term management of post-concussion -con syndrome is also really important because after my concussion, my physical symptoms went away between like probably around three weeks, um, and then I thought it was fine, and then around six months later, I started to develop some symptoms and health problems that eventually escalated to where I had to take a medical leave. And it wasn't until I was getting treatment and out of school that I was told that it was most likely like directly correlated to or triggered by my concussion. But I, I guess I should point out to folks here, um, uh, when you get to the stage where you, you, you feel like you really have a medical problem from this, um, the neurologist will do MRI scans, can do EEG scans, can do spinal taps, and none of that will show anything. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't see anything in these typical imaging modalities and um, there, there's a lot of research going on now to look at different imaging modalities, advanced neuroimaging, like diffusion tensor imaging, like functional MRI, resting state MRI. I'm looking at um, volumetrics, looking at whether all the brain regions, whether there's any brain regions that have alterations in, in the thickness of the cortex or things like that. And so, and doing network analyses, looking at the communication across different, um, uh, different parts of the brain using graph theoretic methods to look at different parts of the brain, look at the brain as a network, see if the network function is at all abnormal. Um, Blood-based biomarkers, there's about five or ten different proteins that are being evaluated now as if those uh, proteins are in the blood at abnormal levels, that might indicate a concussion. Um, we, are, um, we have someone in our institution who can do this with saliva, which is much less invasive, and look and see. and. And uh, so we're measuring uh, a couple of brain proteins right now in saliva, including GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, um, UCHL1. Those two, those two proteins in blood have been approved by the FDA as a tool in diagnosing severe TBI. So if those two uh, proteins uh, together in an algorithm are, are come up positive, then um, emergency room doctors uh, have, uh, the, 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 um, I think the um, uh, CT scans are 95% positive for blood. So if those proteins are present, 
then the CT scan will be positive for blood. And so you can diagnose that earlier without the CT scan and bring people uh, in. So we're looking at, uh, pro and other people are looking at uh, the blood proteins, um, and there are about a dozen of those. There's a bunch of EEG measures, electroencephalography measures that people do. Did they give you an EEG? Do they do an MRI of your brain? Uh, no. How about, no. I forgot your name because you. Melissa. Have, Melissa, yeah. Um, did, did they do an MRI? Not for the concussion that I got while swimming. But how about later on, six months later, did they do it? No. No? no. They didn't think it was related to my concussion at all. Okay. So, um, yeah, MRI is expensive and, it, and uh, um, it, it requires specialized equipment. EEG is very cheap. That's you put electrodes on the brain anywhere between 15 and 250. Um, and there are, um, the more the more expensive, um, but um, uh, they, they now, the, um, when I first got an EEG machine for research, it, the, the footprint was about the size of three of these chairs put together. And now we have a box about this big that we can do at the, at the bedside and the court side. So we, do it, we can do it at court side. And we look at changes in synchrony and other kinds of things. So we're looking at ways to see if there's actually um, something going on. We are not focused on the commercialization innovation aspect. We want to define concussion. And so, um, you know, I asked you guys to define concussion. And, you know, the, the, all the definitions you gave were clinical. They were what the doctor would say, but not what actually happened to your brain. What actually happened to your brain, because the brain images are, are <coughs> and so forth. Anybody in the audience want to comment? Yeah, that's to see what lights up and whether, whether yeah. there's differences. Yeah, the, um, that's not any more revealing than doing the cognitive testing itself. So I've been, that's what my career has been, is functional MRI, mostly in language and cognition. And um, um, you can do that, and there are, there are, there are going to be changes, uh, but I don't think there's a big win doing that over just doing cognitive testing. People, um, if you do certain kinds of cognitive tasks, particularly frontal lobe tasks, um, you know, uh, no go, uh, go no go kinds of tasks, or Wisconsin card sort kinds of tasks, or Stroop kinds of tasks, executive function, cognitive control tasks, um, uh, vigilance tasks. You, you can find uh, uh, changes in people who, particularly um, in post concussive syndrome. Um, early on, there are people trying to do this at courtside too. If you go, at, um, did you guys go to the exhibits at the AAN sports concussion meeting? Did you see all the charlatans trying to send instant gadgets to cure stuff? I mean, it's incredible. You go to the exhibit at this concussion meeting, and there may be, I don't know, 20, 30 plus different companies answering your prayers on doing bedside diagnosis of, of brain injury, and, and it's uh, it's a huge racket. Uh, Dr. Eggelman is an expert at those kind of rackets. Um, but this is a, <laughs> it, it's, a it's an enormous racket. Um, you guys, any, any further comments before we break? I think we're about to break here. What should we be doing? Just uh, what should the scientists be doing? Um. Um. I think that every single collegiate athlete should get the impact testing done, even if it's considered like a low impact sport or no impact sport. Yeah. And it should be done at the beginning of every single school year, not just right. at the beginning. Impact of is actually not a great measure, but some kind of measure. Scat. Yeah, I agree. Some kind of measure. Even the SCAT is. The SCAT's a better than the impact. But even, yeah, I mean, you can do levels of neuropsych testing that are from from very minimal to, to more. But having a baseline, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, do you know anybody who faked the impact test? <laughs> so it's well known. It's well known. You know, if you don't want to be taken out, you look like an idiot at the beginning of the season, and you do a lot better. I mean, these are guys who probably got, you know, they're probably summa cum laude kids in economics here, and they, and they could not, you know, they could not remember three numbers after five minutes, you know. Uh, and and nobody, nobody called them on it, you know. Uh, until, so. until the time came to take the impact test. Yeah. Again, you know, you have a memory score of 99 percentile. And you know you're at the 75th percentile now, and it's like, oh, what am I going to do now? So that, yeah, definitely, you know, I think for that part, while you know the burden definitely falls on the athlete, I think while kind of harping on, I guess, the baseline impact test. I mean, maybe having um, 
because I know I'm not the only one on my team. I know I'm not the only athlete that does it here at Brown. Um, having that be a more regulated thing, you know, having the kids come in. So at Brown, you're probably better at faking it than they are at Michigan. Definitely. Okay. I, I, uh, I would hope so. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I bet more people at Michigan fake it than at Brown. And I bet more. So in women, do women typically fake answers on those things? Or not as much as men, probably? Yeah, probably not as much, but I'm sure it happens. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. David, <laughs> oh yeah, sure. I was just gonna say, it just, it's it's funny to me how uh, in this one area women are always more honest. Like we're never more honest in relationships or That's good uh, to know. stock picks <laughs> or you know. But in concussion, we're supposed to be incredibly honest and you know a mirror into the is our inner world. So it's just. That's not what I, that's not, not what well, I we, find out there, but... Yeah, we don't really know that. You know, what we know is that women have more diagnosed concussions than men. That's the stats from the clinical world. And we don't know why. We have theories. The woman right behind you has a theory that it's related to reporting. I can see by her nods and so forth. <laughs> okay. So the, the studies don't specify the mechanism. That's, that's my... Yeah, no. There's no mechanism in this whole field. Yeah. The whole thing, I mean, you go to the sports concussion meeting, it's run by a bunch of neurologists for neurologists. And, you know, they just want to know how to do their practice better, you know, how long the kids stay out and everything. But the science is, is meager. You look at the number, there's, what, 4 million sports-related uh, mild TBIs in the country every year. And I, I did a search at the NIH website. There may be 40 funded projects by NIH. Compared to stroke, there's probably, you know, hundreds. Compared to cancer, there's thousands. So... We probably got a break, yeah? Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, I'm happy to talk to any of you guys offline, privately, if you have uh, other you know, quite neurologic questions or whatever, because um, we try to avoid breaking privacy rules out here. <laughs> so, okay. right. Thank you, Dr. Small. Thank you to all of our student athletes for taking the time. It's coming up to final season, so we know this is a busy time for you all. So thank you so much.